Thank you. Thank you very, very much, everyone, for joining us. This is the future uh, that was mentioned in the previous session. I am so happy to see all of your faces, and thank you so much for joining us today. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the African uh, Regional Innovation Forum. We started the day today with a high level session, which was then uh, followed by regional good practices uh, that are supporting innovation ecosystems. I hope that you could all attend it because it was a very interesting session indeed that we could learn a lot from about innovation ecosystems and what is actually going right in them. Uh, and so today, uh, or in this session, in this final session, we are going to be zooming in on those who are hopefully enabled by these innovation ecosystems. They are the entrepreneurs themselves. So our speakers today are going to be including uh, ITU Innovation Challenge winners, ITU uh, Telecom Young Innovation uh, Competition winners, and African Telecommunications Union Challenge winners, who are going to be sharing their stories from the region. And so the goal of this session is not only uh, to share success stories of entrepreneurs whom we see as role models uh, in their respective ecosystems, uh, but also to better understand the local, regional and global innovation ecosystems through their stories. <clears throat> what we aim to do today is highlight which parts of these innovation ecosystems have actually acted as enablers for these people. Um, and also what might have hindered them in their entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, this letter, uh, what actually hindered them, uh, might, in my opinion, be seen uh, as especially relevant for decision makers, because we need to first understand the gaps in innovation ecosystems, and we then need to fill these uh, in order to help ecosystems move forward and improve. Uh, I would like to take a second to remind the audience uh, to submit their questions in swap card so that we can pull these in during the Q&A session uh, in the second half uh, of our discussion today. So please don't forget to upload your questions over there. So today we have uh, seven innovators who will be presenting their projects. Uh, and this will happen in a very democratic way uh, in an alphabetic order. Um, I'm going to briefly present them and then I will ask them uh, to, uh, to hold their pitches um, about the solutions that they have been developing for their communities. So our first speaker today is going to be Abdi Noor, uh, who is the founder of the Emlucha app. Uh, the solution won the African Telecommunication Union Challenge and is indeed an offline app that helps young learners uh, access basic literacy and numeracy. Uh, what it does is it uses the language that they understand, which I think is extremely important when we want to create access. Um, the second speaker is going to be Brenda, Brenda Katvasije, uh, who is a winner from the, of the ITU Telecom Young Innovators competition, and she comes from Uganda. Today she will be presenting WasiVision, which is a project that solves critical healthcare challenges. Um, our third speaker is going to be Becquerel, uh, who is a telecommunications engineer specialized in radio communication and will, presenting, uh, will be presenting her solution um, FarmGuard, uh, which won the African Telecommunication Union Challenge. The fourth presenter today is going to be Hajra Kasim from South Africa. Uh, and she will be presenting Hajju Entertainment, um, a film and electronic media company that trained film graduates through a mentorship program that also provides hands-on entrepreneurial skills for the film industry. The fifth presentation is going to be coming from Henry, uh, who is an ITU Innovation Challenge winner, pretty recent. Uh, he has also actually been recognized as one of the brightest young minds in Africa. Uh, and will be presenting his project, Save the Chicken AI. I hope that he has arrived. I know that uh, he has been having some issues with uh, electricity, speaking of infrastructures uh, and access to energy, but I hope he will pop up soon. Um, the sixth presenter is going to be James, James Kiruri from Kenya, who is an ITU Innovation Challenge winner. Uh, today he will be telling us about Teliza, which is a mobile content aggregation and advertising platform for a post-pandemic world. 
we can of course not forget that we are uh, living in a pandemic right now, pandemic right now. So I will be very interested in hearing what kinds of um, problems you have encountered in this situation and what the solutions are that you have found. Um, and our final presenter is going to be Mai Neji, uh, who is a winner of the African Telecommunication Union Challenge and also the CEO and co-founder of DeltaSoft, which is a company that focuses on e-learning and education technologies. So we're going to uh, have uh, three minutes each um, for our seven speakers. Uh, and we ask them to present their companies, uh, but preferably to focus on introducing their solution, why they develop these solutions, uh, and also to kind of zoom out and take a look at the bigger picture that it fits um, into. Once again, if the audience has any questions to our entrepreneurs today, uh, please submit these in, uh, in swap card. And so now I'm going to start the screen sharing. Abdinor, can you... Um, can you let me know if you're ready to present? I'm ready. You're ready. Um, I will have to ask you to speak a little bit louder. And... Mic test. Mic test a little bit louder, if possible. Mic test. That's better. <laughs> Thank you very much. If all goes well, I, you, everyone can see your presentation now. Oh, no. I can see it. Yes, very, very good. All right. Uh, OK, so. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for, for this opportunity. My name is Abdinur Ali Mahdi uh, from uh, a nomadic community living in northern part of Kenya. Uh, I'm an education technologist, uh, MSc with uh, education technology and instruction design. And, and those are my children, as you can see, in Ojia, where we were piloting uh, M Luga app. Uh, these children are in a madrasa. It's a, it's a kind of Islamic uh, studies uh, where uh, it's kind of cultural norm. You have to go through the, the Duxi, it's called Duxi, uh, for you to go to the secular education. So you might find these children might finish that Duxi at the age of 15 and go back to class one, the secular education, with uh, zero you know, uh, literacy. So that's why we introduced MLUGA app, so that at least by the time they go to school, they are equipped with basic literacy and numeracy in the language that they understand. And I think uh, this language problem is an African problem. And that's what uh, my judges were telling me at Africa Tech Summit in Rwanda. They were like, this is an African problem. Every, every African child is struggling with the language. Imagine walking to a classroom for the first time, but the only language you understand is your mother tongue. But the curriculum is in English or Swahili or French or Portuguese or other language. Imagine. So how are you going to learn? It's a situation from unknown to unknown. It's like, this is my head. This is my head. No translation. But uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with M Luga, it's going to teach you the syllabus with the language that you understand, M Luga language. It currently covers around 20 indigenous languages in Kenya. And we are coming to Rwanda and uh, Tanzania and Ethiopia and other parts of Africa very soon. Please go ahead. Um, Next slide. Yeah, sorry. Um, you have one more minute to go, huh? Yeah. And uh, if you don't, this, this is the birth of M Luga app. If you don't understand, how can you learn? That's why the MLUGA came up. Please go ahead. And for your information, I'm also a certified telecommunication engineer. And uh, four years back, I was doing very well in, Af in, in, in the telecom industry. I was uh, doing fiber to the home, FTTH. And then uh, the struggles that, uh, you know, our, our, our region is going through the education crisis left, uh, had, no, had left me with no choice but to abandon the telecommunication industry and uh, ventured into education. Go ahead, please. So uh, why, why, why is M Luga relevant? Uh, according to this tweet by United Nations and UNESCO, M Luga is relevant because 40% of the world, of the learners in this, on what you call, uh, don't access the, the education in the language that they understand, their first language. So I think these are some of the tweets uh, that when we're celebrating the Mother's Day, uh, Mother's uh, Language, Mother Language Day. Uh, go ahead, please. So M Luga app is basically uh, solving language barrier problem. 
where the teacher cannot understand your language, you cannot understand the curriculum, but this uh, MLUGA will going to play an intermediate role between the teachers. Shortage of schools where we have nomadic lifestyle, people are just moving around and with their camels and cows, so they move away from school. Lack of teachers, in our region we had security reasons where non-local teachers were targeted by, by Al-Shabaab and security, uh, you know, other security threats, so they ran away, some schools were closed. And then COVID disruption, now that you're at home, how can you learn when you don't understand the, the, the syllabus? But with M. Luga and the syllabus in your mother tongue, you can, it will bring the aspect of self-learning. Please go ahead. So what is the solution? Solution is a mother tongue-based offline multilingual app. In Kenya here, the language policy covers up to grade three. Now we did we done, we are done with PP1, PP2, and we are going to grade one, two, and three. So the all the app also bring the aspect of culture. Before you go to the to the the actual app, the content, you have to explore the, the cultural aspect of your community. This for Somali uh, community, so you have to go through the, the traditional tools and stuff like that before you go to the app. Please go ahead. So uh, this is the demo, that's a dog and a cat. So below we have two buttons, an English button and the Somali button. So you just have to click. It gives you dog, 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 and then get a, 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 and then cat, 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 and then it gives you, so it's an offline, you can just uh, do it all over, uh, what do you call it, uh, all day long. Go ahead, please. So here are some of the awards by the MLUGA. It was based 100 startups in Istanbul uh, last year, 2019. Uh, out of 160,000 applications, Amelika was best 100. Uh, and also it was best 11 startups selected to pitch at Africa Tech Summit early this year. And then the mother of all uh, awards, uh, ATU Africa Innovation Challenge uh, ran up. Uh, that was, I think, two, week, two weeks ago. Go ahead, please. And this has been uh, the noise I've been making throughout the media from BBC to VOA to our local, uh, uh, what do you call it, stations. And this is what I'm going to tell my, my, my fellow uh, innovators. Please make noise. Make noise. Be relevant. Go ahead, please. And still, I think uh, next is still on the page on the, on the dailies of the Kenyan dailies where I've been also been making noise. Okay, go ahead. Ah, thank you. I think uh, the app is uh, available on App Store and Play Store. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Um, this was a really, really nice presentation. And the next presentation is going to be coming from Brenda from Wazi Vision. Let me just open it up for you. And Here we go. Hi, hi, it's really exciting to, to join all of you. And I'm very, very excited to speak about Wazi Vision. Um, I am Brenda and I'm the co-founder of Wazi Vision in Uganda. Uh, Wazi Vision turns waste into value and we make beautiful, affordable, durable, stylish eyewear from plastic waste. Go ahead, uh, Regina. Yes, so um, if you walk into any kind of eye care center in Kampala today, uh, probably the minimum amount of money that you pay for a pair of eyeglasses will be around $100 on average, $150 uh, with the lenses. So this is the biggest challenge that we're trying to solve, the challenge of affordability of eyewear and eye care generally in Uganda and in Africa at large. And on the other hand, we have a problem of so much plastic waste. Um, typically, uh, collectors in Uganda will export, will, will collect plastic waste, cut it into small pieces and export it to, to China and India. But recently, China is not taking up that plastic waste anymore. So what we are doing is upcycling it, adding value to it locally and making something as impactful as affordable eyewear that is now 80% more affordable than what is on the market right now. Next slide. So we are located in Uganda, uh, in, in Kampala, and we have a facility where we make this. These, uh, these eyeglasses are made with love by African artisans. Uh, they are designed here, uh, created here, and put uh, ev everything uh, that is put in is put in here. So locally sourced material uh, with local uh, women that are collecting uh, and also 
participating within the chain of manufacturing for these eyeglasses. Then these are distributed to, to different people that then buy them at you know affordable, affordable prices. Yeah, so we collect plastic and some of the plastic waste we, we use is PET, which is you know any bottle, the, the bottles that we use to drink water. That is our raw material for us. Uh, we get this from multiple sources, individual collectors, local businesses, corporates, and then we use plastic injection molding technology to make uh, affordable uh, eyeglasses that then we distribute we used to distribute directly B2C, which is business to customer, from us directly to the customer. But now we have strategic partnerships that are helping us distribute this and scale. We are currently in Uganda, but also in Rwanda, and we're looking to scale across of Africa. So the dream is to be the biggest eyewear brand out of Africa, so from Africa to the world. Next slide, Regina. So yeah, we are focused uh, heavily on uh, the sustainable goals uh, being uh, goal number three, which is good health and well-being, uh, decent work and economic growth, and of course, climate action. So if you would like to get in touch, uh, Regina, next slide, please. Uh, this is our contact information. Check out our website on Wazi Vision. You can reach us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. I'm really excited to to be part of today's panel session. Perfect, thank you very, very much. And uh, I just want to point out how, uh, how I appreciate that there are so many different layers uh, to this solution, uh, how many different problems are actually being addressed at the same time. So I want to ask into the round whether Henry has arrived, uh, Henry from Save the Chicken. Unfortunately, I can't see him even though he did message me on, or he did email me that he was joining. Um, all right, I believe that this um, access to electricity might be hindering his access to the, to the session today, which is something that we might need to, we might need to uh, address in our, uh, in our discussion. All right. In that case, I would like to jump back to Becquerel, who uh, I hope he, she can hear me. I know that there is a little bit of delay uh, with the with the interpretation. Becquerel, are you here? Are you ready to present? We oui, allô. Hello, Hello Becca. Uh, you are a winner of the um, African Telecommunications Union. Uh, Madame, c'est Becquerel. Uh, uh, là, je préparé um, I would like to kindly ask you to start your three-minute presentation. about your solution, FarmGuard. Yes, Hello? I can hear you. Ah, oui, madame, oui. Effectivement, j'ai gagné le troisième prix. Oui, madame, j'ai gagné le troisième prix du challenge organisé par l'Union africaine des télécommunications. Là, j'ai préparé euh, une présentation que je ne pourrais pas partager parce que j'utilise mon téléphone pour pouvoir assister à cette rencontre. Ma machine n'a plus d'autonomie, faute d'énergie. Moi, je vais vous partager, euh, je vais partager avec vous la vision du projet que je porte, le projet FamGat. Euh, nous ne pouvons aujourd'hui euh, Nous ne pouvons plus douter de l'importance du secteur agricole pour nos différents pays. Euh, C'est un secteur porteur qui déjà nous fournit les moyens de les moyens de subsistance nécessaires pour nous nourrir et aussi il contribue euh, grandement au développement économique de nos pays. Mais seulement ce que nous constatons, c'est que euh, ce secteur fait face à plusieurs problèmes 
plusieurs de difficultés qui l'empêchent de jouer pleinement son rôle. Et dans le, dans le cadre de notre projet Femme Garde, nous avons décidé de nous avons décidé de nous attaquer au problème de euh, au problème de la destruction des cultures agricoles par les animaux, les animaux souvent appelés animaux dévastateurs. Alors, ces animaux euh, généralement euh, euh, détruisent nos cultures dans, dans les différentes phases de production. Par exemple, lors des semis, nous constatons souvent que lorsque nous mettons les graines dans le sol, des animaux, des oiseaux viennent les déterrer. Lors de la sortie du, euh, du sol des jeunes plantules, nous avons des animaux qui viennent couper les feuilles, ce qui les empêche d'avoir euh, un bon développement, une bonne croissance. Et encore lors de la maturation des produits, on constate souvent que les animaux s'attaquent aux fruits de ceux-ci sans qu'ils qu ne soient mat euh, déjà matures. Et cela cause de nombreux pertes pour l'agriculteur. Si par exemple, il avait espéré avoir 8 tonnes, par exemple, de maïs, il se rend compte qu'il aura euh, approximativement 5 tonnes. Et aussi, les agriculteurs sont amenés à déployer du temps et des ressources supplémentaires pour pouvoir compenser euh, les dégâts causés par les animaux. Donc, notre solution, Femme Garde, c'est un kit électronique qui éloigne les animaux de, 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 de vos plantations agricoles. Donc, lorsque vous déployez votre kit, euh, ce kit dans votre plantation, il va émettre des ultrasons qui vont stimuler le système nerveux de, euh, de l'animal. Et ce dernier va se sentir mal à l'aise, ce qui fera qu'il s'éloigne, qu'il sorte du périmètre de couverture de ces kits. Alors, nous envisageons par notre solution, bien évidemment, d'augmenter la productivité des exploitants agricoles et aussi euh, ce qui permettra de booster l'économie de nos différents pays. Je vous remercie. Thank you very, very much for this short and very, very informative summary of your project. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to now continue with Hadra, Hadra Kassim, who will also be presenting verbally. Please don't forget to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Hajra Kassim and I'm uh, from South Africa. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, Regina, for this um, topic. Uh, I work in the film industry in South Africa. So we do a massive international series like Origin, Mad Max 4, um, Raised by Wolves, which was the last job that we did. And our company aligns itself to uh, gear rentals. So we work very closely with Panelox Panavision for big, massive cameras, gear, and lights. And uh, our niche is also to empower young students who come through university or film school and give them training and skills development opportunity on film sets. Um, because of COVID, um, from January, we have lost all our contracts. It has been difficult for the film industry. Um, it has decimated the film industry, basically, because of international travel. Most of our clients are international. So uh, the innovative solutions have had to be of what we're doing on set. And one of the things that has happened very quickly is that little pockets and hubs and collaborations have occurred online using green screen or blue screen techniques and videos and commercials are now being edited remotely rather than having people on set. South Africa has uh, had very strict, one of the strictest lockdowns in the world For five weeks, people were in total lockdown where you couldn't leave your front door basically unless you needed to go for medical help or to go to the shops. So that meant that um, there were medical challenges. Um, you couldn't be on a film set until two months ago. Um, people couldn't make movies the way you used to make movies. Uh, it's social distancing, it's masks, it's sanitizing. Um, so two beautiful things came out of that, and the one was a recycling project started by the South African Film Academy, which is a not-for-profit, where young innovators and young solutions-driven uh, um, graduates based in the school 
could come out and do environmental studies um, and looking at where we can film and can't film. And also they began doing recycling projects. So they would recycle uh, 10 times more than we did pre-COVID because it became very important to realize um, an impact assessment on what uh, the film industry has on the environment. So that was the first thing. So heightened awareness in terms of marine biology, uh, ecology, where you're filming, how you're filming, um, health protocols in place. Uh, local communities began to get affected because uh, work was outsourced to local people rather than internationals. So it sustained uh, the South African economy to a degree. And also most of our learning has moved to master classes online. So that has been a huge uptick. It, we used to be very traditional. We want to be in a classroom. We want to be with a lecturer. We want to be taught. And in a space of six months, everything's moved offline. Classes have been moved remotely. Um, collaborations have happened. And movies are being created entirely online. And because cinemas were shut down and there was no access to traditional forms, Another innovation that came about was uh, what was known as cottage um, uh, or garage industries where a group of only 10 people could go and watch a movie, but innovation um, existed around how they watched the movie with social distancing. So that was really wonderful. So COVID has had positive impact in terms of solutions driven obviously negative in terms of economic impact because of the big um, industries from overseas, but it's made us more focused on South Africa as a continent, I mean, as a country, and also that young um, graduates are, are leading through technology um, in how they see filmmaking and how they approach the new COVID protocols on a film set. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for these very uh, interesting and just very up-to-date insights uh, that you've had about the industry and how society has been, you know, trying to, uh, trying to navigate around the, the, the new normal, as they say, which I think is very far from normal. So very interesting. Thank you very much, Hadra. Thank um, you. Keeping an eye on the time, uh, I'm just going to ask into the round again whether Henry has arrived. Uh, and if not, then we hope that he will maybe pop up as the last um, speaker. Um, in that case, James, I hope that you're ready to share your story with us. James Kiruri, are you here? Yes, I am. Um, Very nice. I will Regina. be sharing your presentation. Okay. Go ahead, James. Excellent. Th thank you. Thank you, Regina. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining this webinar this afternoon. Um, as, as has been said, my name is James Kiruri. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, today I'm going to talk about Teleza, um, a revolutionary mobile content aggregation and advertising platform uh, that we have developed uh, since February 2018. And now it's actively in the market, having gone through um, an MVP. Um, next slide, please, Regina. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, if I could give you a, a bit of a background um, on, on the media landscape, landscape in Kenya. Um, Pre-2015, uh, radio was the main companion. Uh, TV sets were few and far between. And internet wasn't uh, um, that readily available. Then the digital migration happened um, in between 2012 and 2015, and media consumption moved from appointment. An appointment is where you, you, you made a date with a radio or a TV set um, to either watch uh, news or get uh, content that was of interest. What then happened after that, um, it became the Wild West, um, as the internet is now. Um, lots of digital channels, numerous blogs, um, and this is on top of um, the what was already existing uh, as traditional media so so the the internet became uh, a place that was was very congested and not very easy to find uh, content and then uh, came the mobile phone and in particular the smartphone 
and the medium has since changed and it's became mobile first. So um, most or majority of people now accessing content uh, via mobile first before they go to any other uh, device. Um, as Teleza Africa, we, we've got a founding team uh, with diverse skills, uh, but very strong uh, media experience. And then of course, uh, come uh, March for us, uh, COVID-19 happened and certain behavior changes um, happened. Uh, for instance, um, what would happen before, um, if you look at traditional media, newspapers and magazines, uh, this would be shared uh, among many people. In fact, they say for every newspaper to be read by between 10 and 20 people. Um, and that, of course, has changed. Uh, and a lot of the content now is consumed uh, digitally and online. Uh, next slide, please, um, Regina. And that's why um, we came up with Teleza. Um, and why Teleza? Uh, with, with all this um, um, mobile devices available uh, with internet access, we asked ourselves, how can we use that to then deliver content? And not just deliver content, but deliver it in, in, uh, in an innovative, simple, and convenient way to, to, to our users. And we are using what we call the lock screen, which is basically the first screen on your phone when you unlock the phone. Um, you get content that uh, is of interest. We curate it based on your interests. Uh, we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to learn uh, what um, is relevant content for you. And that's what you get uh, served with. Um, the plan is to start in Kenya, which we've already done. Uh, Teleza is already in the market and, and you know, getting great traction. And then we'll uh, build it to the rest of the region and into Africa and, and hopefully to the rest of the world. Uh, next slide, please. And our core pillars, um, we've got four key st stakeholders. We've got the user, we've got the advertiser, uh, we've got publishers. Um, we have over 50 of them uh, already on the platform, uh, local, regional, and international. And of course, the element of choice. Um, the users uh, can now find content fairly easily um, and, and based on choice. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's about Teleza. Um, and, and those are my details. Uh, and thank you very much for, for, for this opportunity to talk about Teleza. Thank you very, very much for sharing this with us. Uh, and so now we have arrived at the last presentation before we go into our, uh, before we go into our discussion round. Uh, Mai, if you're ready. Yes, welcome Regina, welcome for you all. I'm so happy to be here today. I am May Nagy, CEO of DeltaSoft and co-finder. Uh, this is an Egyptian company, uh, works in e-learning. And uh, nowadays, education faces a lot of problems. And one of the most important of their problems is contagious diseases. Next, please, Regina. Contagious diseases like COVID-19 leads to closing the most uh, schools in uh, African countries. Next, please, Regina. And crowded school also created weakness in traditional education itself. Next. Also lack of resources because not every school uh, has developed the uh, science lab. So uh, science virtual lab is so important uh, because a lot of uh, reasons. Next, uh, next, please, Regina. Thank you. Virtual Science Lab consists of a chemistry, physics, and biology 3D lab. It helps students to perform the experiments by himself in safe environments. Uh, it uh, solves the issues of capacity availability and uh, dangerous materials, gases, etc. And also, Virtual Science Lab provides instructions, information, and videos for how to perform uh, the experiment in the right way. Next, please, Regina, two slides. Another one, thank you. Sorry, uh, this one? Uh, yes, this one. Uh, also, a uh, virtual science lab uh, provides 3D modeling of the human uh, body. Uh, when uh, any students uh, uh, need to know more about any organ, he just uh, uh, chooses it and uh, separates it from the body. And he can rotate it to see uh, from uh, all sides 
And if you uh, want to know more about it, just to click on this organ. Uh, uh, video appears to uh, explain how this organ works and uh, its functionality. Next, please. And now we have uh, Peshwa Science Lab in Arabic language, and we are working uh, on localizing it to English. And we have planned to uh, provide French and Sawahili version uh, to make sure that all the students has the same chance in education. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very, very much for sharing this with us. Um, and I think that uh, all of these different solutions are just, you know, mirroring a lot of important questions that are uh, that are out there right now. And this is actually why I am so passionate about uh, about grassroots innovation and solutions coming from, you know, sometimes the most uh, surprising places, because uh, it is the entrepreneurs who can um, answer to societal questions really, really fast. Now, I just uh, got the news that Henry has arrived. So if we can move him to the panelists group, uh, then uh, he can also present his solution, Save the Chicken AI. Before we have a quick wrap up. ITU colleagues, could you please help me? ITU colleagues, could you please move Henry into the round of panelists? Excuse me. Um, Henry Save the Chicken uh, has arrived um, as an audience member and I would need him to be moved to the group of panelists. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Uh, hello, Henry. I'm happy that you're here. Uh, did you have some electricity issues or what happened? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, That's uh, all right. Some challenges, but then I'm okay too. I'm good to go. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that and so happy that you have, you know, you have managed to arrive. I'm going to be sharing my screen now with your presentation. <laughs> Okay. And uh, please feel free to get started. Okay. And so, five minutes, or three minutes. Uh, it's good to go. So, yes, my name is Henry Gale and uh, I am the CEO of Forty Farmers Management System. Next slide, please. Now, in Cameroon and um, in so many um, developing countries and even the, in and even developed countries, um, so many livelihoods of farmers, to, uh, poultry farmers, are being constrained because of critical mortalities. You know, farmers because of diseases, critical mortality because of diseases. So these farmers, they they don't have the access to because they are small in scale, so they don't have the access to quality veterinarian services or to have a veterinarian on farm, like being on the farm. And 80% of the market is not yet serviced by traditional bread services. And uh, there's high risk of disease from farm to farm disease spread. You know, when uh, a veterinarian move from one farm to the other, there is this high risk of, of, of disease spread from one farm to the other. And so currently in Cameroon, one in every seven chicken dies before maturity. And that's about 15% which is really, really enormous. Likewise, in other countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, even in backyard farms in the Europe, the US, it's still just the same thing. And so most of these farmers, they lack access to market to, for their ready products when they have their products are ready, like their chickens or their eggs. Next slide, please. And so I cannot do this alone. So this is the powerful team behind. And it's a family, like stakeholders coming together. But the expert there is like Dr. Berta uh, with worldwide networks of over 500 rates in Africa and 60,000 farmers like um, Chachi Mambe, one of the techies, 
created by Forbes among are like the best cities in Africa. Rose Palaji, the, the brain behind the Jumia e-commerce Cameroon penetration, and my humble self, expert is in animal feed production and also the senior advisor of Southwest Livestock Farmers Union. So we came together and helped to solve this, this, this problem. Next slide, please. You know, we decided to, to solve this problem in a simultaneous way. We know there is a, um, a farmers need to identify these diseases early enough and take adequate measures so that it should not get escalating. So farmers can instantly use the smartphone to do um, early disease diagnosis by taking the, the by taking a photo of the chicken feces or the chicken itself. And uh, our software is able to tell you if the chickens are sick or not in an early stage. So you can prepare well on what to do. That's for farmers. And then for veterinarians, yeah, you can connect, you can, you can scale your practices to farmers worldwide. You know, you can be in Cameroon and you're servicing a farmer down in some region or in some village in Kenya or in Nigeria, the same, and you have more income, like income stream for yourself. It's just a small token. Yes, because we're trying to make sure that all farmers have the access to veterinary services. Uh, you can consult, you can um, uh, buy products and so on. So for, for, for farmers as well, um, uh, you can sell your products to ready market still on the platform. So people are like hotels, restaurants, and middlemen, they can just, you can sell your products directly to them, which when your products are ready for sale, you, you just go and see what you are say, selling and it gets directly to the, far, to the buyer through an SMS. So we're trying to make sure this becomes very inclusive for everybody. And so livelihood for smallholders farmers becomes, it's what we want because these people, they contribute so much in our country GDP and still remain poor, even being in farming for decades, you know. So that is what we have been able to do. And uh, I welcome any questions. And next slide, please. Thank you. You can get in touch with us at any time. We are ready to serve because we want a food, a sustainable food systems. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very, very much for this, Henry. Um, wow. And so we have uh, about 10 minutes left um, for a really brief discussion. And uh, so I would like to maybe start with, um, there are two things I would like to focus on. Uh, when you look at your own ecosystem, uh, so these have been presentations about, uh, about the projects, the problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, but of course, uh, entrepreneurs cannot succeed without a healthy um, supportive uh, ecosystem that can help them, um, you know, become sustainable. So in the next 10 minutes, I would like to focus on two key points. What has been, uh, what kind of support have you been receiving from your ecosystem? Uh, and what was it that you would have wished for? So the first question uh, focuses on um, kind of informal interactions uh, and exchanges that are there. I know that Henry hasn't mentioned this, uh, but his uh, seed, uh, you know, seed funding, uh, the first uh, mover investor was actually his mother um, who uh, put her savings into, into the project. Um, and so I think mothers often don't actually think of themselves as uh, early stage investors, so to say, but there are a lot of such informal interactions that, they, that play crucial roles, especially when there is a gap um, in the ecosystem. Uh, and of course, an entrepreneurial person will always find a way to bootstrap and solve issues that they encounter. But um, can you think of examples of how, of, uh, from your entrepreneurial journey, um, how there was maybe a gap uh, in the innovation ecosystem um, that you would have wished uh, that it had been addressed earlier um, or uh, a gap that maybe, you know, you had to uh, bridge um, or overcome with the help of, uh, of, uh, of your immediate environment that normally you wish uh, that it would have been addressed um, by, um, by the innovation ecosystem um, delivering the way that it should. Um, and excuse these blue things that I have on my body. <laughs> Anyone can start. Um, 
Okay, so let me say something. Uh, I think uh, one of the greatest challenges I've ever had is uh, uh, not thinking straight about collaboration in the early stage. You know, um, uh, thinking that uh, you want to just develop some kind of a groundbreaking project or a product where everybody will just get into it. And I found out that there was this disconnect between um, uh, um, uh, the farmers for like the farmers and uh, the people who have to create the solutions. So many a times uh, we just think we, we can do it all not knowing that the, the, the best thing so far is to be on the field and to see exactly what you can change while doing it right there on the field. And for, for issues we have faced, like the, the greatest challenges we have faced is uh, connectivity, like um, we try to partner with um, Be Bound, come, uh, Be Bound um, um, augmented connectivity in France to make sure that we can have these people in the rural areas can be able to access um, a connectivity while using our solution. So I think as a, as a personal challenge or a company challenge, we have faced problems of, of connectivity in rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Connectivity and infrastructure in general, and especially in rural areas, um, has also been a, a major topic in the in the previous session. I think that that is an that is really an excellent point, um, and especially ensuring that people who would like to do something new, they don't have to move into a big city, but they can, uh, you know, they can they can work on their solutions wherever they are, um, empowering rural communities. Through, through infrastructure. Um, Brenda? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I'll speak about this from both, uh, you know, country perspective, Africa-wide perspective, but also a global perspective. I'm just very glad that the innovation ecosystem is global in a way because, you know, I can connect with all of you amazing entrepreneurs via Zoom, via this platform, and I met Regina at the ITU Young Innovators uh, competition, which was a long time ago, but we, we, we connected. I'm from Uganda and I connected with so many people out of, his, of, of my country. And I got so much support in terms of me mentorship and actually the funding, all the funding that I have got as a business has come from outside of my country. Now that's a great thing, but it's also a big, it highlights a problem uh, for the Ugandan ecosystem. A typical uh, Ugandan investor will invest in land, a piece of land or a building, and they will not invest in a startup, right? So it's taking people from outside of, of, of my country to actually support this. It's, it's funny because two weeks ago, Paystack was bought by Stripe for $200 million. And I, I read a story that the, the Paystack guys asked the government to invest in them a long time ago, and they refused. <laughs> so uh, this here comes Stripe and Visa and bigger um, companies from outside of our ecosystems that are seeing the opportunities that we're not seeing. So I think in a way, uh, the challenge is how can we, people within our ecosystems also create the value and the change that we want to see within our continents as of course external people in the in other countries are also seeing the opportunities here so i think it's 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 a it's it's a win and a, and a loss on one side uh, and the other so yeah um, I really appreciate what you said about uh, an innovation ecosystem that doesn't necessarily have to be, it can be a village, uh, it can be a region, it can be sub-Saharan Africa, but it can also be global, right? Um, and as long as you have the access to that global innovation ecosystem, um, that is, uh, you know, that is probably, probably a good solution too. I really hope that um, people who are sitting on this panel today are actually going to be the ones who are going to be creating the future um, and uh, just bringing in all those good practices uh, and altering them to uh, ensure that the local innovation ecosystem can work um, in a happy and healthy way. Um, Abdinur, would you like to say something? Yeah, I kind of uh, 
like uh, their suggestion by uh, Brenda. Actually, it's true that uh, most of the African startups are never funded by African people. Most of them are not even uh, bought by or funded by African, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, the ones with the money. And uh, that's a very, uh, what do you call, uh, a very, uh, very discouraging uh, uh, point. And actually, uh, if you tell an uh, you know an African guy like, hey, let's build a hundred million story building, they go look for money, bring it. But when it comes to startups, actually, no one's really like to invest in startups. Uh, but in Kenya, I think Africa is also waking up. And in Kenya right now, we have a startup bill by by the Senate, which is, I, I hope is going to play a very important role in supporting incubation and uh, and the startups. Uh, it, we are joining the likes of Tunisia, Tunisia, I think, and Senegal, which already adopted the startup bill. And uh, I hope uh, that startup bill is going to be a blessing to us because as we speak right now, we in Kenya especially, we have a hard time uh, as a startup because of the bureaucratic nature of the institutions. Like for example, my app has to go to the, through the Ministry of Education. For you to get the approval from the Ministry of Education, you have to maybe pay a lot of money as a startup uh, to get approved. Maybe you are, your startup is in the health sector. You have to go through the health uh, ministry for you to get approved. So you see, going through the government uh, offices is really, really troubles. So sometimes you might even take two years to go through the, you know, the the, the approval by the by the relevant ministries for you even to go to market. So I think uh, if we have maybe a, a very nice startup bill where your startup, you know, gets uh, a tax relief maybe or uh, or maybe funding by the government by your government instead of looking for an outside investor. It will be, I think it, all, this, all those things has been captured by the, by the startup bill. So let's see if it goes through. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, financing, uh, just kind of making the bureaucratic processes somewhat easier um, and legislative measures um, to help uh, people make uh, their dreams happen, as it is obviously so important um, for every single uh, society. Uh, that uh, yeah, that entrepreneurs entrepreneurs can thrive. Um, we have a question from Swapcard, and we need to wrap up in two minutes. So I'm going to have to ask um, everyone to maybe just answer um, in one word um, or half a sentence. So it's a quarter of a tweet. Let's say it that way. Um, what um, kind of support from your local, regional, or in international even um, ecosystems, let's say, um, have you received? Um, and so, yeah, if you had a wish uh, for your government and other ecosystem actors, um, what would that be? So if you had one wish, uh, what would you wish for? Just one, two, three words, please. Uh, but I would like to hear from everyone. And let's do this in alphabetic order once again. Um, so let's start with Abdinur. Uh, I wish that we had uh, fully equipped incubation and uh, startup support hubs in, in our regions where every, every, anyone with a crazy idea can just walk in and then get uh, supported financially and, uh, and in, in terms of information and also networking. All right. Thank you very much. Crazy ideas to be supported. Brenda? Uh, my wish is uh, for us to build uh, an ecosystem that churns out paystacks every now and then. So. Um, my wish is that we grow and develop our local um, South African economy because the borders are closed. So to use um, cross collaboration with other support systems and besides the film industry to find um, common denominators with other um, systems, ecosystems and collaborate with them. Mm -hmm. Exchange of best practices, so to say. Thank you very much, Henry. Yes, my own wish is um, um, we as entrepreneurs, we should start thinking about investing in various in fellow entrepreneurs, like being an investor. We shouldn't wait for these um, other people out there to come to invest in our own ecosystems. We can do it. So I think a ten dollar will help a small young entrepreneur to start something, or maybe a computer, a laptop will help a, 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 an entrepreneur to start something. So we, I, I see innovations in the U.S. where uh, 
that they invest in in training you how to code and you will pay only when you have started working so that's a long-term investment but we we, we don't see that so i think we should start like trying to invest in young entrepreneurs ourselves because we can spare some 10 50 20 or 100 dollar bill so we can start doing that mm -hmm. thank you Thank you very much. Uh, this could happen in Abdinor's uh, innovation hub <laughs> where crazy mm -hmm. ideas are shared um, and then co-founded. Um, uh, James? Um, le le legislation that is uh, geared towards um, uh, startups and, and, and small businesses um, and, and stronger and better enforcement of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, May, what would be your wish? Yes, I wish to work with uh, ministries uh, of communication and education all over the African countries because uh, most investors uh, don't like to invest in education. All right. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for all your insights. Uh, I wish we had another hour uh, because I know that we would have a lot more to share. Uh, but now I have to pass the word um, on to the regional director um, so that we can wrap up the final session and the regional forum. Thank you very much for, um, for participating in this. It was really lovely to see all of you.